Well, it looks like our numbers have stabilized, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and officially welcome everyone to this uh, iteration of SEDS Online. My name is Frana Kashuk. I'm at the Kansas Geological Survey here in Lawrence, Kansas, USA. Um, uh, before we get started with today's webinar, I'd like to thank the sponsorship of the International Association of Sedimentologists, IAS, which allows us to offer these resources free of charge. Um, make sure to check out the SEDS Online website for more info on upcoming events and meetings uh, and to see everything available to the community. This includes uh, teaching resources um, as well as uh, meeting resources. Today's lecturer I'm going to go ahead and introduce is Dr. Charlie Bristow, Professor of Sedimentology in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences uh, at the Birkbeck University of London. Dr. Bristow has studied sedimentary systems on every continent and not to be content as simply an Earth scientist, he has published on Mars and Titan as well. Uh, some enduring themes that emerge from Dr. Bristow's publication record include work on windblown sediments, braided rivers, and ground penetrating radar, the last of which is what Dr. Bristow is going to talk about with us today. So Dr. Bristow, the floor, the digital floor is yours. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you, Frank. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming along and uh, listening to me talking about uh, GDPR and sedimentology. Um, I'd like to thank all the uh, students and collaborators who've helped me in the, over the years uh, collecting data. Um, it's not something that I can do by myself. I always need two or three uh, assistants with me. Um, and I'm afraid I don't have uh, time to, to name check everybody. So uh, uh, just a, a general thank you to all concerned. So um, this afternoon, um, I'm going to be sort of structuring the talk. I'm going to give a, a relatively brief introduction to GPR. Uh, and then I'll try and point you to some of the um, key references uh, so that if you want to read up about it, um, that's probably the best way to do it. And then I'm going to look at a bit of the sort of history, starting with some um, ground truth studies, um, things that we did to look at uh, what was actually causing reflections in the subsurface, um, the depth of penetration, how deep we can image, what we're imaging and how deep we can image with uh, GPR, and what's known as the, the range resolution trade-off, which is um, quite important when you're considering survey design, um, what you're going to be able to see with the radar, because there is a um, big compromise to be made between the, the resolution from the wavelength and the depth of penetration. Uh, and then we'll go into um, a little, some examples, some case studies. Okay. So radar um, has typically, the ones that uh, I use, have um, a transmitter and a receiver. And um, so we have two boxes in the field attached to antennas. And uh, one of these will be a transmitter, the other will be a receiver. And the transmitter uh, sends a, a signal down into the ground, and that is reflected from changes in the dielectric properties, typically layers of uh, sediment, say sand to, to peat or something like that. So it's gonna have a contrast in the uh, electrical properties that will act as a reflector. Some of the signal comes back up to the surface, picked up by the receiver, part of the signal goes back down, and again, some of it comes back up from the next layer. And we build up uh, an image of what's under the surface by taking multiple uh, measurements. So you take a measurement here, then you move, say, 20 centimeters forwards, take another measurement, move 20 centimeters forwards, and by doing that, you build up a profile. It's also worth pointing out that the top of pretty much every GPR profile, you'll see uh, two black and white uh, lines, which are the direct arrivals, because as well as going through the ground, the signal is also going through the air, and the radio waves move at the speed of light. So when the transmitter goes bing, it sends a signal, and that will be picked up by the receiver. Um, there is also a second arrival, which is the uh, direct wave traveling through the ground, um, sometimes right along the surface there. Uh, and that will come a little bit slower uh, because it's moving through the ground, so it comes in a little bit later. 
the record is always shown in terms of time, which uh, you will then have to correct with the velocity for what the depth is. So you'll see these sort of two black and white bands at the top of most profiles, which are the direct waves, first through the air, then through the ground. After that, reflections uh, will be from those changes in the electrical properties in the subsurface. Now that's about as, as um, minimal a description of GPR as I can sort of give. Um, there are lots of things that go on uh, within the ground. The, the signal spreads out and becomes weaker as it spreads out. Uh, we have that reflection uh, where some of, some of the energy is going down, but it's going to get progressively less and less because you're reflecting some back up to the surface, which is the part that you want to record. Uh, we also get scattering and we get losses from attenuation, the conversion of electromagnetic energy into um, heat, polarization of water, um, various other sort of electrical things that will happen um, that uh, affect the signal. We then set out uh, to collect the data, and uh, then that's followed by lots of processing and interpretation. Um, I want to just sort of make a point from, from a sedimentary perspective that when you're doing your survey designs, um, you want to try and, and get serial sections um, or grids so that you can image things in 3D. And then if you go for, for true 3D, then your point spacing and your line spacing should be equal. Um, what these little, little diagrams show is that each of these, basically we, we, the, the length of, of all of those four profiles there is the same as this one here and the same as that one there. So you're collecting the same amount of, of data uh, in each of those uh, surveys, but the area that you're covering gets less and less each time. So um, if, you, if you have sort of serial sections, you can cover the ground quicker, collect more data. Uh, if you get a box type grid, then that's going to take a little bit longer uh, to collect. If you do a 3D grid, it's going to take even longer to collect. You'll get much denser uh, data. Um, and it takes a lot of extra processing power, but it's going to cover a much smaller area. So there's there's always trade-offs going on here. This is this is a trade-off between the data collection, the amount of time you've got in the field, um, and the sort of information that you're going to get at the end of the day. Now I could spend this whole hour talking about GPR, data collection, design, processing. But that's really not why you're here. You want to hear about sediments and sedimentology. So uh, the best thing I can do is to uh, recommend uh, a couple of papers, and uh, particularly um, this review that was written by Adrian Neal in 2004. Um, it says what it does on the tin. It's like uh, ground penetrating radar and its use in sedimentology, principles, problems, and progress. And that's in Earth Science Reviews, and it's a really good place to start. Um, around the same time in 2003, Harry Joll and I organized a conference at the Jollstock in London on ground penetrating radar and sediments. And there's a, there's a book uh, that came out from that. Uh, and um, paper here uh, by Harry and myself on GPR and sediments, advice on data collection, basic processing interpretation, a good practice guide. So I would very much encourage any of you, uh, if you want to go out and, and do some radar surveys before you pick up the radar, uh, is to, to read those two papers. Um, they are, give you a lot more information and um, also you know, means I don't have to spend a lot of time talking about uh, processing and, and survey design. So looking at early days of data collection, this is one of the first uh, bits of uh, radar data that I that I collected, um, and it's from a paper from 1995, so that kind of dates me a bit. Uh, it just so happened that um, two of the uh, places that, that hire out uh, geophysical equipment in the UK, uh, one of them is based in Leighton Buzzard and another one not far away, um, and there are sand pits there. Um, so this was an ideal opportunity to use the radar uh, in a place where we know what the stratigraphy is, because there are these, these sand pits which are being excavated, and you can see this uh, fantastic set of uh, cross stratification with tidal bundles in it, uh, in Leyden Buzzard. And because it was a working sand pit, they stripped off the overburden, we could get 
directly onto the sand. And we could collect sort of grids of data. And this is what we call a, a closed loop correlation. Um, so you can sort of follow the, uh, the bounding surfaces between the sets of products stratification. And uh, so this, this profile is going along, then into the face, uh, along in the opposite direction, out of the face and back again. So the, uh, the, it, you go right the way around the, around the loop. Um, and that gives you confidence when you can see the reflections going from one panel to the other and through the corners. A, you know you've got a, a really nice 3D, 3, 3D view there, but you've got confidence in the correlation. If you can track it around, then that really gives you uh, um, good confidence in your interpretation and, and that the imagery is working well. And this is, uh, came shortly afterwards, a uh, paper uh, in 1996 in sedimentology, uh, Bristow, Goodall and Pugh, uh, where we went out to the Liwa in uh, Abu Dhabi uh, with a, a radar and we were investigating the uh, structure of, of sand dunes there. And it was um, very kindly, uh, they, they gave us a, uh, the use of a Caterpillar D9 now bulldozer uh, to cut through the dunes. So we, we poured uh, 24,000 gallons of water onto the surface of the dune to try and stabilize the surface. Uh, and then this uh, bulldozer arrived on a low loader and um, the, the driver promptly uh, proceeded to try and flatten the dune because that's what he did. That's what he was paid to do. Was typically, uh, if dunes were encroaching onto the roads, they just graded them off and flattened them. Uh, and after a while, we managed to persuade them that we actually wanted to cut down through the dune rather than flatten the whole thing. Um, and uh, so we had to go on a, on a, a bulldozer trenching sand dunes, which is uh, good fun. And here's some of the results. So the, uh, the GPR in those days was uh, actually recording um, directly onto uh, paper, uh, which was in the back of a uh, four by four parked in the desert. So you had like a, a drum recorder uh, collecting the, the signal. So they um, couldn't, couldn't do as much processing on that as we, as we could today. But uh, you can see a set of, of dipping reflections um, two, two, two surfaces that are inclined here from left to right. And then there are um, steeper surfaces between that. These are, are reflections from the cross stratification and the bounding surfaces. And you can see the same shapes here, bounding surface coming down there, sets of cross stratification, and another bounding surface coming in at the end here. So we were getting um, very good confidence in the data that we really were imaging the sedimentary structures and the bounding surfaces. And what, what was remarkable is these, these surfaces are like, you know, just a millimeter or so thick. They're, they, they're not very big, um, but they're being picked out on the radar, even though uh, the wavelength of the radar is actually considerably longer than that. And the, uh, there are two things to take away from this. One was that the, um, the radar was working really well and imaging the, the cross stratification and the bounding surfaces, which was, which was great. Um, the other is that you can see the, the face, what's happening to the face, where it's weathering away and why we can see the sedimentary structures there. And that's due to the moisture content in the sand. And the, the fine grained sand will hold a little bit more water by a capillary effect. And the coarser sand dries out. So where we're seeing the, the sets of cross stratification picked out here, what's happening is that the, the finer grains are holding a little bit of water, they're a bit more cohesive and they're holding up. Whereas the coarser grain sand dries out and falls out because it's got less moisture between the grains. And that's what the radar is imaging. The, the biggest single control on the reflection characteristics, the dielectric properties of sand is water content. The water content has the, the, the biggest effect. So what we're seeing when we're, when we're imaging with the radar are these ch subtle changes in the dielectric properties of the sediment. And that is primarily due to the water content of the sands. So when we say we're imaging sedimentary structures, 
typically what we're imaging is, is changes in water content, which are associated with the sedimentary structures. Now, having said that, there are some physicists who have worked on this, and they've actually said that even if it was perfectly, perfectly dry, right, completely dry, um, that the physics of the difference in the grain size would still show up. Um, now, dune sands are, are rarely perfectly dry, um, but even if they were perfectly dry, you would still be able to see the sedimentary structures in there because there is sufficient uh, contrast in the uh, dielectric properties between the different grains uh, and the different layers and the, the grain contacts that you, you would actually still see that with a radar. So one of the questions that we get asked uh, if you're out in the field with a radar is, you know, how deep can you see? And um, there's my uh, good friend, Harry Joel here. And um, Harry with his uh, supervisor, Daryl Smith, um, they produced this paper, which has uh, the maximum probable depth um, of uh, radar in, in uh, sediment. And um, I'm gonna show you some examples with the 100 megahertz antennas here, okay? So there's 100 megahertz antennas. And uh, if you follow that one down and to the lower limit of penetration and then you read across, that says that you should be able to go about 37 meters as the, the maximum depth. And typically if I'm asked to sort of forecast, well, how, far, how deep will you go? I'd actually only predict that we were only gonna go sort of you know, maybe 10 meters or so with the, with the uh, radar with 100 megahertz because the ground conditions are normally less than perfect. So this is in, you know, perfect conditions. Prediction is that we get down to about 37 meters. Notice that if you have a higher frequency, it goes less. So at 200 megahertz, uh, you, you read down and across, now that, that's, that's less. If you increase uh, the, so if you, if you go to um, 50 megahertz, lower frequencies, then you go deeper. So what happens is that the uh, lower frequency, 50 megahertz, has a longer wavelength. That longer wavelength lets you go deeper down into the subsurface. The higher frequency has a shorter wavelength and that has less penetration, but because it's a shorter wavelength, it has that higher resolution, which is the range resolution trade-off, which I'll come to in a moment. So this is a, a really fun project that I did with um, Harry and Paul Augustinus. Um, Paul's from uh, University of Auckland, and this was funded by Antarctica New Zealand. And uh, part of it was uh, looking at a um, Mars analog study uh, for very cold, very dry environments. Antarctica obviously is the coldest uh, and driest continent on Earth. It's also the windiest, apparently. Um, so you, you may not normally associate sand dunes with Antarctica, but here are some sand dunes and as a glacier. So this was the biggest dune that we could find in Antarctica. And uh, here's a, a topographic profile from a LIDAR survey. Uh, so that's uh, 400 meters elevation there, 350 meters elevation here. So at least 50 meters high. We reckon in total, it's about 70 meters high. And we're gonna run a, a GPR profile. That's where the, the uh, line of the topographic section goes over the top of this uh, LIDAR image. And this is a, a field photograph uh, with, with uh, Harry and Paul. And here's some of the data. So this is 100 megahertz data uh, with a 500 nanosecond time window. That takes us down to, on this one here with this depth scale, uh, that's about 30 meters. And you can see that there is coherent data going off the bottom of the screen. So um, thinking back to that previous diagram of how deep does it go, or the, the maximum probable depth uh, that uh, Smith and Joel had, had said uh, in their paper was that it would be about 37 meters. And okay, here we go. There's, there's good data, reflections from the sand dune. This is, the, this is the same profile up here in this direction. So uh, where that data is being collected like that, that is the data that's being collected up the dune. And these are the layers of sand within the dune. And you can see the reflections from those layers disappearing off the bottom of the screen. So we've got 30 meters of, of good data there, and we're probably missing something else. So we, we opened up the time window uh, to record more data. 
and uh, we actually went to over a thousand nanoseconds. And bearing in mind that that dune is uh, about 70 meters high, we're seeing most of the way through the dune. Okay, so these are those uh, reflections that we could see from the start, uh, disappearing off the bottom of the screen. By the time we got beneath the, the full thickness of the dune, we're seeing about 50 or 60 meters through a 70 meter high dune. So the uh, prediction was it would be about 37 meters. We're way down here. We're, we're, we're right down at the bottom of this thing. We're, so our 100 meters there has gone off the bottom of the screen. Uh, the reason for that is because we are in Antarctica and uh, the water is frozen. Because one of the things that uh, causes attenuation is the polar polarization of, of water molecules, which will absorb some of that energy. Uh, and because the water is frozen as ice, then uh, you can't get that polarization effect. And so uh, the radar will go much deeper. And radar works really well in ice. And it's widely used for profiling glaciers um, and um, working out ice thicknesses of ice caps. So ice is very transparent to radar. So I'm going to take you a, another example where we were explicitly looking to test uh, the uh, depth of penetration and this uh, range resolution trade-off. Um, and we were going to use a wide range of antennas, starting with the uh, 200 megahertz, uh, then the 100s and the 50s and uh, 25s, and then uh, we even managed to piece together some 12 and a halves, uh, which you would not normally use because of the size of them. Uh, they were really difficult to operate in the field. Uh, and we needed a, a really nice outcrop to work on. This was the place that we chose in the, um, Zion National Park. And, and there's, there's Harry at the back and uh, Daryl Smith here. And this is what the outcrop looks like uh, from, the, from the side. So that photograph just now was, was up here on that uh, platform. Uh, it's basically a, an exhumed bedding plane. And uh, you can see a series of, of dune sets of cross strata. Uh, the first one about 4.6 meters, the next one about 6.4, the next one about 10.2. So there's a, there's a sedimentary log here uh, made with, uh, you can see the toe sets coming through and the sets of cross stratification. So we're gonna be running the radar across that surface there, trying to image these different sets of cross stratification, to see how deep we can image with the radar using those different wavelengths, looking at that um, range resolution. So as we go to lower frequencies, you're getting uh, longer wavelengths. So you're getting deeper, but you're losing the resolution. So with 100 megahertz here uh, at the top, you can see we, we've got that first set of cross stratification. The four sets are nicely exposed. Uh, they're, they're, they show up really well. The um, bounding surfaces picked out, going down to about 10 meters with the second set. And we're, we're imaging into that third set, uh, good sets of cross stratification down to about 15 meters. The uh, resolution with the uh, 100 megahertz is about half a meter. If we um, go up to the, the 50 megahertz, uh, then we're getting deeper. Okay, so the, the hundreds you can see, you know, you could just about pick out the cross stratification there at 15, but you weren't getting down to the next bounding surface. With the 50s, we're getting down to the next bounding surface, um, but we're losing resolution up in the top here. Yeah, we're, so we're starting to lose resolution here because the resolution is, is now one meter, but the depth of penetration, we're down to about 22 meters. When you step up to the 25s, then it goes deeper still. Uh, and we're going down to another set of cross stratification beneath that one. So there's that reflection, which was at the bottom of the uh, 50s, now much clearer with another set of cross stratification below it. And then the 12 and a halves, um, probably these, these lower reflections down here, these are probably coming back off the side walls of the canyon. So these sort of crisscrossy ones down at the bottom, I wouldn't trust. Um, so we're probably not going much deeper um, with the um, 12 and a half than we, than we did with the uh, 25s. And the resolution, we've completely lost that upper set. You know, the, uh, the wavelength is such that we're not resolving any cross stratification in that upper set. We've, we've completely lost it. 
So this is what we mean by the range resolution trade-off. If you have a lower frequency with a longer wavelength, you will see, see deeper, but you lose a lot of information as you go. So if you have a shorter wavelength, higher frequency, then you get more information, more, more resolution, but the trade-off is you lose that depth of penetration. So I tend to use the hundreds. The hundreds seem to work well for imaging the sort of sedimentary systems that I'm interested in, whether it's sand dunes, river deposits, coastal sediments, beaches. Um, the hundreds seem to, to, to be a sort of in the sweet spot, if you like, of that range resolution we're seeing down 10, 20 meters, and we're resolving at the half meter scale. So it's sort of packages of cross stratification, bounding surfaces, river channels. Those are the sort of features that we could typically resolve with that, with those antennas. Um, just to sort of back to the, the outcrop correlation there, backing that up. Um, so you can see where the, the bounding surfaces correspond uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the sedimentary log that was created down the canyon. And there's the size of those 12 and a half megahertz uh, antennas with Gerald. Um, uh, they're not something that you could, you could practically use in the field. They, they were so unwieldy. Uh, there's a very nice example from the 200s uh, where we have a, a, a grid of data on the, on the outcrop. Um, and the resolution of the 200s <coughs> is, is better still. Um, but the, the depth of penetration, we're seeing the, the top two sets there. Uh, it's a re really nice um, little model, 3D model that was created uh, by collecting a series of lines very close together and then stacking them up. And uh, then you could slice that and, and look at the uh, sets of cross stratification and, and spin it around. So collecting 3D data is, is really good, but it takes um, a long time to collect and process. And so there are only a limited number of studies using 3D. There are more coming along every, every year. Um, this was a relatively early one, uh, but the, the, the data does look fantastic if you, put, if you take the, the time to go and collect it. So one of the um, studies that um, we did in, in Namibia was to look for uh, the structure of linear dunes. Uh, linear dunes are the most widespread dunes on Earth and uh, their structure is relatively poorly known. Um, and as a consequence, linear dunes are rarely recognized in the rock record. And there was this sort of um, question of, um, well, why is that? If linear dunes are so common in the, in the present day, and uh, many parts of the, the deserts, particularly Australia, which we'll, we'll come on to in a minute, Saudi Arabia, linear dunes dominate those deserts. And they're, they're also very widespread in parts of the Sahara as well. So you would expect that uh, the rock record should include more linear dunes. So the question was, well, is our, is our model for the structure of linear dunes right? So we could test that using the GPR. Um, one of the questions which had been posed by uh, Dave Rubin was, um, do these dunes move sideways? Because if they do, then the structure that you would get would look like transverse dunes um rather than linear dunes and so they might be there but we just weren't recognizing them so we set out for namibia uh, myself and two phd students and um, this was the the first of the dunes that we worked on i'm going to show you uh, three uh, examples uh, one here this is the what was uh, dave uh, called diddy dune um dave dave had uh, I think some Liverpudlian background there. Uh, so that this little one was, was called the Diddy Dune. Uh, and then the second one is this uh, big one, which is the, the big sort of 60, 60 meter high dune, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. And uh, the third example was over here. So there's, there's three studies. They're all fairly closely, uh, close together, uh, close to the research station at, at Copper Bell. So these are the profiles through um, the what we call the, the Diddy Dune. And if you start up at the, the north end of it, you can see sets of cross stratification that are dipping in one direction. So that, that sort of kind of confirms the idea that they can move sideways. And the next profile does the same thing, again, dipping left to right. But by the time we get to the third one, 
you're seeing cross stratification dipping in both directions. Um, because what's happening there is we're going going around uh, a wiggle in the in the crest of the dune. Okay, so it's a sinuous crested dune, and the outside of the bend is moving towards the left. So whereas the, the first part of the dune have been moving towards the right, because that bend is shifting, the dune is now moving and uh, building out towards the, towards the left. And as we go further down the dune, it gets progressively more complicated with sets of cross stratification dipping in both directions. And then eventually we start to get superimposed dunes appearing on the flanks. And so as we go to the, the larger dunes, we expect more superimposed dunes to appear. And this is a profile across the, the bigger dune. Um, this one uh, now is about 600 meters wide and uh, about 60 meters high. And you can see within it uh, sets of cross stratification and very prominent bounding surfaces. Again, showing the dune has basically been moving in a lateral sense, it's been moving sideways. And um, we then spend a lot of time trying to auger boreholes into this dune. Um, we had a few failed attempts with the, with the augers, which I can tell people about at some point. Um, and then we, we got samples for OSL dating so that we could determine the age of the dune. And um, the numbers are a bit small on this figure because we're trying to get 600 meters of dune, uh, 600 meters width and 60 meters high. Uh, so they're summarized here. Uh, basically, within the pink area, they're about 5,000 years old. Uh, within the, the yellow area, they're, they're 2,000 to 140 years old. And in the green area, they're less than 52 years old. So the, the green part at the crest of the dune is relatively young. And this has been uh, deposited by the, the superimposed dunes, which are migrating along the flanks of the dune at the moment, the present day, they're moving along the surface of the dune, moving north. But on the longer term, the dune has been moving sideways. So this kind of confirmed the model that uh, uh, Dave Rubin had put together in the paper by Rubin and Hunter, that the linear dunes move sideways. And as such, that might explain why we weren't recognizing them on the rock record. And then lastly, uh, from the Namib dunes, this is a, a slightly smaller one, what was called the, the station dune, um, where we use the radar to work out the relative chronology by picking uh, bounding surfaces. You see sort of truncations of the reflections here. So that will mark a, a time gap uh, where there are, there are reflection terminations um, because the, the wind is never constant. It's always moving around. So the dune is shifting one way and back the other. And then picking sample points for, for dating at uh, one end of the dune and uh, in the middle of the dune. And again, collecting uh, samples of sand for OSL dating. And then based on the age determination, okay, this one came out at 1.7 Ka. And this one came out at, at 99.99, so 900, 990 years old. Uh, and this one came out as, as 0.34 Ka, uh, so 340 years old. And then where the, the end of the dune is at the present day, and then we could work out the uh, average rates of migration of that dune over time. So over a thousand years, it's moved at a rate of 12 centimeters a year. So it's moved really slowly across the landscape. Now, what that is a, is, a, is a net movement. It will, have, it will have moved one way and then flipped and moved the other way, moved forwards, gone back. And that's sort of kind of recorded by the uh, bounding surfaces in there. But it, it's not a steady or consistent rate. There are lots of breaks in the deposition as it went. Oh, I went backwards by mistake. So GPR works really well in, in dune sands because dune sands usually, they're very quartz rich, uh, so they're highly high resistivity, um, so we get a good depth of penetration. We know the velocities, because we've done lots of measurements for, for the velocities, so we can be fairly uh, confident about our, our depths, and by um, 
doing the uh, depth corrections, um, for example, on that on that previous one, you can see that the base of the dune uh, is coming out pretty flat, relatively smooth surface that the dune is migrating over. So we've got the right velocity to compensate for the topography on the top. And when we're drilling through it, we know what depth we're getting to. They contain these large sets of cross stratification, which again are suitable for the imaging. So the GPR will, will image that cross stratification. It will image the bounding surfaces. We can build up a, a stratigraphy using the cross cutting relationships uh, within the dune and the superposition of the different surfaces. And then from that, we can establish a relative chronology. Based on that relative chronology, we could then pick points for dating uh, using OSL. And then that would allow us to determine the age of the dune. And then from that, we could work out the migration rates. And then we could start to infer something about the dune history and the controls on deposition. Now, that was Namibia. And uh, based on the success in Namibia, we went to Australia and um, tried to measure the uh, internal structure of those uh, big old linear dunes that dominate uh, the, the continent of Australia. So vegetated linear dunes, the most extensive land from Australia covering almost 40% of the continent. Um, and we took a lot of data and none of it was very good. So, um, Here's some examples of GPR profiles over linear dunes in Australia. And we have lovely black and white tram lines at the top, which are those direct arrivals from, through the air and through the ground. And then inside the dune, there is very little. It's just like a scattering of uh, signals. Uh, some places you can just about pick out the base of the dune there. Okay. And again, in this one here, you can pick out the base of the dune. And down here, we're, we're even losing the base of the dune. And this is not a big dune, right? That, that is five meters there. So this is like five to 10 meter tall dune. And we're barely seeing the base even. So we're not even seeing the base below 10 meters of dune sand. Whereas uh, in Namibia, we're seeing 20, 30 meters into the dune. Um, on that uh, example from it was called the station dune, you could see right the way through the dune, you can see all the cross stratification, you can see the base of it beautifully. So what's going on in Australia? Why is the radar not working in Australia? Well, the first thing is these dunes, they're big and old and red, and they have got virtually no internal structure. You can just see some very vague lamination in there. When you, when you try to trench into it, there is no detailed structure at all. Uh, this is due to uh, pedogenic processes. Uh, Australia is, is famous for having uh, lots of, of bugs and things that want to eat you. Um, so there's a lot of bioturbation going on. The dunes themselves are relatively old. Um, so this is the, the age in thousands of years. Now that's these are actually I say relatively old in comparison to uh, Namibia. Um, they, that is older than the dunes in Namibia. And these are smaller. So you know, the, the, that big dune in Namibia um, was about 5,000 years old on, the, on the, the oldest part of the dune. And that was 600 meters wide and 60 meters high. The, these dunes, uh, if you sort of look back at the, uh, the dimensions of them, and uh, this one here, you know, it's about 60 meters uh, wide and it's about 10 meters high. So it's a lot smaller, but they're older. They've sat there for a very long time going nowhere. And this is partly due to the vegetation. So there's a lot of time for pedogenic processes and also uh, something called illuviation, which is that um, clay, which is trapped by the vegetation uh, and then wash down into the dune. So the age of the dune, okay, so these are, these are TL ages for the dunes, going up to 25,000 years here. Uh, this one here is 35,000 years old. So these are a lot older than those Namibian dunes, even though they're smaller. And the clay content getting up towards 30%, that's mud, sorry, mud content. So that's, that's clay and silt, mud. Um, so they've got a very high content of clay and silt, 
And so that is basically stabilized in the dune. Now, it's probably the clay minerals in there that are what's causing the attenuation of the radar signal. There is a lack of sedimentary structures in the dunes in the first place, which is probably why we aren't imaging them. They're just not there um, because of the bioturbation. So those pedogenic processes, because those dunes have sat there for a very long time, going nowhere and just accumulating clay and, and grass, and being chewed up by the insects and things that burrowing animals that live in them. Uh, there was no internal structure there. So bad luck for Cameron and uh, the other student that we had in the field with us who had a very frustrating time uh, trying to collect uh, data across uh, those dunes in, in Australia. Um, but there was some uh, success because uh, we went to the coast and um, worked um, with <coughs> PhD students from University in, in Wollongong um, at this area here, which is uh, called Guichin Bay. Well, it's got a fantastic uh, beach ridge plain with, with um, loads and loads of beach ridges across it. So we could take a couple of kilometers of, of data across here. And the data is brilliant. Lovely uh, GPR profile, really good inclined reflections from the beaches. Uh, the prominent black and white reflection across there is the water table. So this is, this is all below the water table. So this is the, the beach. And above the water table are basically dunes. So the ridges on the surface are dunes and beneath that uh, there are these uh, beaches. And you can see sort of changes in the dip. This is probably when storm events have come through uh, and then it sort of rebuilds and prograde and then it gets truncated. So it's probably, the uh, chronology is probably interrupted by a series of um, storm events, some of which will have uh, trimmed back up into the dunes and then it's prograded again. So there's the water table and then these uh, reflectors, uh, which are picking out the shore face uh, as it prograded and built out. And over time, uh, you could see from the uh, east end of the profile, the, the beach was relatively low angle and relatively um, thin because uh, the water was shallow. And then as it prograded further out into the bay, uh, it got deeper and uh, the forceps deepened up because the wave energy increased as it went further offshore and built out. Um, so a couple of things we'd, we'd noticed there. One was that those uh, four dune ridges, because they were they were dunes, they don't actually necessarily match with the prograde and the truncation surfaces and the subsurface because the, the beach and the dunes are not directly linked. Um, that beach slope increased uh, and the thickness of the beach increased as it prograded into deeper water and the rate of progradation slowed to, to as the accommodation space, the water depth increased. And there's been um, a lot of uh, really nice GPR papers published since then on the uh, uh, beach ridges in Australia. Uh, and um, so give credit to, to uh, my Australian colleagues there who, who've uh, used the radar a lot and OSL dating and radiocarbon dating to uh, work out the chronology of the beach ridge system. Staying in the Southern Hemisphere, have a quick uh, detour to uh, New Zealand or as a, a project they're working on the uh, beach volumes. Um, this is the, the Waitaki River and uh, it produces this uh, big fan of sediment that's uh, currently being eroded. And uh, with survey data, um, they'd worked out the sediment um, input from the Waitaki River. Um, they had data on the uh, rates of cliff erosion from historic maps and aerial photographs. And they'd even come in with boats and measured the offshore bathymetry. But the, the unknown was what's happening in the beach zone. Um, so uh, we were using the uh, radar to image the uh, beaches here. Uh, so a particular um, favorite profile coming up, uh, this one, which I, I particularly like because it just shows the stratigraphy so clearly. Um, the change in the radar fasces, landward dipping reflections from washovers, seaward dipping reflections uh, from the beach prograves. Uh, you can see that the beach berms and you can see onlap relationships. You can see truncation in here uh, and you can see the, the original surface of the land uh, which the uh, beach has, has washed over onto. And you can very clearly see the, the, uh, the volume of the beach ridges. And then the, uh, the, the, the little inset one down here is the, is the volume of the sediment that was in the beaches. Um, as you go north, and you can see that uh, 
very nice uh, increase there as it goes past the Waitaki River. Uh, and then uh, the amount of sediment in the beach ridges increases as you go past the Waitaki. So it's relatively low down in the south and increases as you go towards the north. Um, but really nice little study there uh, in, a, in a paper by uh, Dixon et al. I'm quite keen on the idea of using the radar to quantify things, the sort of uh, the, the age rates of the dunes, the, the volumes of the beaches, and um, continue to try and get use, use it so that we've advanced from purely what's there, can we image it, to right, can we, can we say something more useful uh, and, and keep going with this sort of applied sedimentology, working out sediment volumes, rates of accretion, rates at which dunes have migrated. Uh, just, just as we were starting, we were mentioning the Niobrara River, uh, which has uh, major floods last year, and, and that one has um, aggraded and, and avulsed. And this is a, a little project that I did with uh, Ray Skelly, who was a student of uh, Frank Etheridge, uh, working on the Niobrara River, um, just showing an example of, of fluvial. Um, so I, I didn't just sort of stick to, to dunes and beaches, I wanted to get different environments into this talk. Um, and some 3D data again, mapping out uh, scour hollows around uh, sandbars uh, and that was collected in this area up here in the middle of the, the shallow sand bed braided river of the Niobrara and it just happened to evolve uh, that year so it's changing course so it had abandoned this route or was partially abandoned uh, and uh, flooded the state park and was heading off uh, down towards the Missouri River on the other side of the bridge there. And another uh, applied aspect, um, I said earlier that ice was um, very transparent to radar. Something else that's transparent to radar is peat. Um, radar goes through peat really well. And this is a small project uh, with Andreas Heinemeyer uh, from University of York. And he's got all these trial plots out for controls of what happens to um, if, you, if you burn the peat, uh, sorry, if you burn the heather rather, there's a lot of um, arguments in the UK about control uh, for um, grouse shooting, particularly of heather, whether it should be burnt or not, and how much carbon that releases, uh, whether you could mow it, and uh, that would um, be less damaging for the environment and produce less carbon. So uh, it's just about blanket bog vegetation, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, and, and water regulation. It's a sort of the background to the project. And we got all these tri trial pots and uh, we're working out what the thickness of the peat is. So uh, we went around each of these trial plots doing little little box grids. And you can see very clearly where the base of the peat is. So it's sitting on the top of carboniferous rocks. And uh, it's, uh, it's 1.8 meters at that side of the plot and up to 1.2 meters on the other side. And you can trace it around and do, a, again, that sort of closed loop correlation around the size of the plots. And we did this for all of the plots all across the moors. Uh, I've got a nice uh, image of the peat thickness, and there's a lot of uh, GPR, applied GPR, working on peat bogs because of that carbon sequestration question. Don't want to leave out the carbonate sedimentologist. Uh, Steve, Steve said he was uh, interested to, to hear what I had to, had to say this evening. Um, and uh, this is a paper by Adrian Neal, a uh, guy who wrote that um, review paper in Quaternary Science Reviews that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and he went off to Florida to work with Mark Grasmuck and uh, looked at um, some of the oolite shoals that are preserved uh, in near Miami. Um, and they collected some 3D uh, data and compared it with, with outcrop. So um, that's a comparison with the, with the outcrop. And the next view should be a nice uh, 3D with a slice through it so you can see the orientation of the cross stratification. Uh, and um, they've also done these uh, sort of fence diagrams as well and uh, reconstructed the internal geometry of the oolite shoals. I'm afraid that's the only carbonate one I put in. Um, there are others uh, that have been working on, on castification, particularly, and there are, there are a few um, uh, sort of coral reef type ones as well. Um, but I, I've, just, I've just used one example here. And then for something completely different, again, this is um, kind of a fun one, um, GPR mapping of meerkat burrows. Now, this uses a really high frequency radar. 
So this is much higher than I would normally use. Um, and um, it's, it's a project from, from Adam Boo that leads. Uh, and uh, it was part of a um, documentary series on, on, on meerkats. Uh, so uh, they set out to map the subsurface distribution of the meerkat burrows. And what's shown here, this is a, this is a, a map which has been colored up with depth going down to the darkest colors are going down over a meter. So the deepest part of the burrow system up in this corner here, they're going down about a meter and then they're coming up to the surface and they're crisscrossing. Really complex pattern that they've managed to, to uh, work out from uh, GPR surveys across these uh, dune sands in the Kalahari where the, where the meerkats have made their burrows. And another more recent, quite innovative paper. Um, this is uh, from Urban et al, 2019, um, looking at these uh, footprints that have been recorded um, around the Alkali Flat area near, near White Sands. And I think they've uh, recently been dated as the, the oldest evidence for uh, humans in North America. Um, and uh, you've got human footprint trails, which are being picked out by uh, changes in the um, amplitude of the uh, radar signal. So these are these are amplitude maps. Okay? So you've got high and low amplitude. So the high amplitude uh, is the darker colors and low amplitude is the paler colors. And alongside the human footprints, they've also mapped in larger footprints, some of which are from uh, mammoths and others which are attributed to, to ground sloths. So there are, there, there are human trackways there, there are mammoth trackways, and these are, these are crisscrossing um, and uh, they've mapped in the distribution of the, of the different footprints using, again, it's a very high resolution GPR, um, and um, that was published in, in scientific reports. Okay, so those are kind of nice examples um, where, it work, where the radar works well, but it doesn't always work well. And I showed you one example there from Australia where we had a few problems. Um, other things to take into consideration if you are planning a survey is uh, external sources of electromagnetic radiation. The uh, radars that we use um, tend to be uh, not shielded. That means that um, if you've got external sources of high frequency radiation from walkie talkies, microwaves, cars, um, that will come through on the signal. Overhead power lines, electric fences, uh, these can all cause uh, interference. Also, we get a lot of attenuation if you've got saline clays and things around. So that, that's a problem as well. Another thing is that the antennas are not shielded so that they're getting uh, reflections from up in the air as well as down in the ground. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with that and also the equipment itself because um, certainly the ones that I have have uh, fiber optics in the field and they Quite often someone trips over them or they get accidentally jagged uh, and um, batteries run down or sort of you know constant little things to watch out for in the field and then you've got the data processing and then the interpretation afterwards so going out and collecting the data is just the first part there's a whole load more work to be done afterwards so happy to to, to uh, promote radar but it comes with a bit of a, uh, a warning sometimes you you uh, you get more than you bargain for so this is an example um, close to home uh, where we're getting these airwaves. These are reflections coming through the air uh, from the tree guards, uh, these large hyperbolic reflections. We can tell what they are because um, the velocity is uh, very similar to the speed of light. So we know that's the airwave, that's the, the that is the signal through the air. Uh, so we, we can match that up. And also the fence there, okay, um, it's a fair distance. Uh, the distance to the tree there was 5.5 meters. Um, the uh, distance to the fence was 12 meters. Uh, and so we're still seeing this, this reflection down here. That's coming from a fence that's 12 meters away. So you have to be a bit careful about what we call side swipes, things that are off the line of the survey that appear because the radar is not focused. The, the airway goes out in every direction. And so you can have things that are off to the side that appear to be underneath you. And in Australia, we've got tree, okay, uh, because there's, there's virtually nothing else coming back from under the subsurface, so trees are a problem. I have worked in woods in the UK where it's fine because the 
contact with the ground, the ground conditions are good, trees barely show up. In Australia, because the ground conditions weren't very good, we're seeing things up in the air more than we would under the ground. Uh, overhead power lines, okay, here's an example of, of overhead power lines. Again, from Australia, uh, crisscrossing here with these three overhead power lines and the, the curves that they're producing um, as we go underneath them. So in conclusion, um, GPR, non-destructive and, and non-invasive, um, it's relatively quick and easy to collect the data, and it provides a, a unique insight into the, the shallow subsurface, which we can use to uh, look at sedimentary problems and questions of, of stratigraphy. Um, we are imaging the primary depositional fabric. Sometimes that is because of the presence of, of things like heavy minerals in there and changes in lithology, but more often it's actually the water content that's what's really showing up and creating the reflections. But that water content is typically associated with the changes in grain size, and those grain size changes are associated with the sedimentary structures. So if you like, you are seeing the primary fabric, but it's the water content that is actually what's showing up on the um, radar because that's what has the greatest influence on the electrical properties. It works really well in high resistivity sands, gravels, peat, and ice. It struggles in saline environments and clay-rich environments, and, and then it doesn't work so well. So the ground conditions are important. Um, if, if the ground conditions aren't right, then you're just not going to get good data. And then after that, you've got to look at survey design, processing, and interpretation uh, as you get to your results. And uh, I would argue that it, it's better than trying to use boreholes, where you just get one set of data. Uh, and although it was great fun driving a bulldozer in the desert, um, that is particularly damaging for the environment. And a radar is a, a lot greener uh, and uh, a much better solution, a lot cheaper too. And uh, so I would always go with the, with the radar over the bulldozer. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Charlie. That was a fantastic presentation, uh, a broad a broad uh, view on the world of GPR in sedimentology. We already have our first question here. Hi, Charlie. Dan from Vienna. Great oh, hi, talk. Dan. Great talk. Thank you. Keen to hear how you see GPR research evolving in sedimentology in the coming years. And which sections do you most want to image that you haven't been able to get to yet? Or have you actually imaged them all already? <laughs> all right. Thanks, Dan. Um, so where are we going? Well, the, the 3D um, is clearly where things are going. It's, um, you know, it, it takes more time to collect the data, it takes more time to process, um, but the value you get out of that at the end of the day, uh, so more 3D surveys. Um, where would I go that I haven't been already? Uh, that's a challenging one, isn't it? Um, so, it's got to it's got to be somewhere warm and tropical and 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 a nice uh, bit of bit of carbonate somewhere. Um, I haven't done much much modern carbonates, and I I think you know get 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 the snorkeling on at the end of the day and sitting sitting there uh, on a tropical beach. That sounds pretty good. Excellent. Yeah. Always we always need more carbonate research in the world. Um, uh, piggybacking on that, while we wait for more questions to show up. Are there mineralogical issues with GPR? You, you talked a lot about sand, which I assume is mostly quartz. Um, would, would doing GPR at white sands give you a much different, do you have to tune your GPR for that sort of mineralogy? So um, there are surveys at white sands and um, there's some um, quite nice data that uh, has, has been done. Um, I think it's uh, Brunovich uh, who's collected the GPR data. Um, and um, you don't get as great a depth of penetration because of the salinity of the waters in that area. Okay. Um, but the gypsum, the gypsum basically is, is resistive. Uh, the only the issue is the amount of salt there. So the attenuation is greater. But they've got some very nice. Uh, high resolution, quite shallow, but high resolution images of the uh, dune forceps there. Um, the paper um, looking at sort of development of protodunes, so the, the, how the small ones develop, and they've, they've sort of mapped those out, out over time. Um, and um, so uh, white sands gypsum works fine. 
carbonate sands, um, have, I have done a little bit of work um, in Bermuda where we're looking at cemented carbonate sands and um, the data is uh, from that I think one or two of the profiles were pretty good. The issue is as you get more diagenesis, uh, then that's starting to overprint the primary fabric. And so then you're seeing something different. You know, we're, we're no longer looking at the primary fabric, we're seeing the diagenetic effects coming through. And um, that can as be a consequence, they're, they're not as easy to, you know, they're, they're not as easy to read and understand. Um, and I've seen some really nice um, work that's been done by um, a group in Brazil who've been working on castified limestones there. Uh, and they've done some, some fantastic work with uh, 3D um, GPR uh, <laughs> for, it's for a reservoir analog project, um, but they're, they're mapping in the uh, classification. Really, it's looking really nice data. Excellent. Great. We've got uh, another question here. Super cool talk, Charlie. Valentin from RWTH Aachen. Is there any movement toward machine learning for GPR in the same way we see it in seismic? I assume that's about processing and, and the like. Yeah, um, an interpretation, trying to automate the yeah. interpretation. Um, there are there are a few papers out there of people trying to, to do that. I think one of the issues we have is with the, the processing that's, that's required. I mean, right at the beginning, I was talking about the, the, the losses of the signal due to spreading, the uh, losses due to scattering, um, and um, as well as that, the, the reflection that every time you reflect something, obviously you've got less energy coming back. So in order to compensate from that, you apply gains. And every time you put a gain onto that data, ideally you'd have an exponential gain, which would, would boost it and it would boost everything equally. Um, but once you've done that, you're then changing those amplitudes that you're kind of wanting to map in the first place. So that, that footprint bed, it was, a, it was a map of amplitudes. And it's those sort of amplitude anomalies that people are mapping out in 3D, which are, which are giving us new data that we weren't see, able to see before, which is, um, that's, and that sort of thing does lend itself to automation. But the problem is that the, the processing steps have to be managed quite carefully and they often have to be um, like almost bespoke. Uh, so you, you're, you're, you can do, you can go so far, uh, but, the, but the processing stages in order to get you to the product that you could then let your AI do your interpretation on, kind of has to be done almost uniquely for every site. So it's difficult to just give it to a machine and say, go on and do this, because it doesn't know what it is you're actually looking for at the end of the day. So for example, the footprint beds, if it didn't know that you were looking for footprints, it, it might map something completely different. And that, right. that, you know, so it's kind of, you, you kind of need to know where you're going, what your objective is at the end of the day, the processing stages as well. So it's, it can be done, um, but it kind of has to be done almost on a unique basis for each site because of the processing stages and the interpretation objectives often are themselves unique as well. Great, we got a few more questions that have come in. Cool talk, Charlie, says Claire McGee. Um, just wondering if you know much about the consolidation of sediment on the resolution. Um, would you get decent imaging on unconsolidated sands versus more consolidated? Okay, so so I um, we haven't actually tested that as such. There are people who've, who've tested things like sort of water infiltration into sands. I haven't seen one done on the effects of compaction. Um, from sort of basic understanding of the physics, then uh, it might make a small difference. Um, but I would imagine that the, the structures that are the, the layers within the sands are going to be uh, preserved. So uh, there might be small changes, but I wouldn't expect them to be significant. No, not, not big changes. Mohammed Rosli says, thanks for your great presentation. What do you think about the future of using GPR for shallow hazard detection and things like seabed mapping? Okay, well, unfortunately we can't use it on the seabed because of the conductivity of seawater. So um, it, it, it can't be used for, for that. But in terms of hazard mapping, um, GPR has been used for defining faults and fault zones. Um, looking at the offset of um, stratigraphy. So for example, 
where you've got uh, a normal fault and extensional, and you've got sort of uh, colluvium wedges uh, in the in the downthrown side, so you get an idea of what the uh, slip magnitude is and, and the wedges of colluvium. So GPR has been used in that context. Um, I have a, a student who's been working with uh, trying to map um, tsunami deposits using GPR. Um, so there is another example where it could be applied in 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 hazard. Uh, it's been used on rock glaciers. It could be used on um, landslides. Uh, so there are other hazard type related uh, places where you could use the, the radar. Unfortunately, not the seabed. Yeah, yeah. There's things like chirp data that you can do to give you similar high resolution look at the shallow sub sea floor. So um, there's some other applications. Uh, Noor from Hungary, thanks for the great talk. I'm wondering about the calibration step before field work. Um, what do you need to do, I guess, before you go in the field? And also, you showed an example about bad data in Australia. How did you continue your field work? What did you use <laughs> instead of GPR? Okay, uh, so we just persevered. In Australia, we just persevered, and uh, we, we, we carried on. Uh, or we, we didn't give up on the first dune. It didn't work on the first dune. We tried the next one, and then the next <laughs> one. And it didn't work there. So we, we went a bit further, another 100 kilometers, tried another area, another area. We 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 on it. We we spent um, yeah. My the, the, the two students I had were getting increasingly frustrated with me because I was still insisting on yep. We're going to try it. We're going to try it. We're going to do this one. This one. Uh, we worked our way across the whole of the, the Simpson of the Strzelecki Desert. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we didn't give up. Um, although they were, by the end of it they were very keen to get back to the bright lights and their girlfriends. Um, <laughs> But then the, 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 the payoff was that when we went to the coastal environments, we got really good data. So I, I persevered personally. Um, the, the other part of the question was about the, the sort of the, the planning. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that, that is important. And um, that's why I was emphasizing in, in the talk this uh, range resolution trade-off, because that's going to determine which equipment you take. You know, if you know what sort of depths you want to, to uh, see, try to image two, and also the resolution, what the objectives are, then you can plan what antennas you need, what frequencies you want, and also start to think about the, the step size and the survey design. Um, now, in terms of whether the ground conditions are suitable, um, that's a bit more tricky, but effectively, if it's um, sands and gravels, you should be okay. The more clay there is, that's when you start to get into problems. The, the, Clay typically comes with attenuation, um, but I have I have you know I have had success in some areas with fine sediments, um, but old cratonic areas like Australia, unfortunately, uh, that was that was that was bad. Uh, it didn't like Australia. Excellent. Have you used other geophysical surveys in the same uh, in the same survey areas you've done with GPR, like maybe magnetometry or something like that? Not mag, but we have done resistivity surveys. Um, so resistivity um, goes to, goes hand in hand with radar because um, the more resistive the ground, the better the ra radar is going to be. And so there are some people would argue that you should do a resistivity survey first because then you get an idea of, of whether radar is going to work or not. Personally, I, I find it's easier just to go into the field with the radar and find out whether it works and do the resistivity. But we have done comb combined uh, resistivity and GPR surveys. Uh, particularly on some um, glacial outwash sediments and uh, um, that the were in the UK, uh, so they're not too far away to, to go and do it. Um, but that 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 is something else that you could do to do a sort of field investigation if you have a resistivity kit, uh, and then once you know what the resistivity is, then you then you can sort of predict where the where the radar is going to work. Cool. Um, we've got a question from Silvio or Silvia Barredo in Argentina. Um, great presentation. Thanks a lot. Have you have you ever worked with karst environments or cave environments? <laughs> um, funny, funny you ask that. I, I, I had a very uh, nice nice trip uh, to uh, Natal uh, in Brazil uh, to to uh, visit the guys out there who are working on karst environments um, with with radar, uh, and um, they they're doing some really nice uh, survey work there. So. Um, that was not my project, um, but it, but the I, the data they were they they were getting out of that was looking really nice. 
Yeah, I can I can imagine it might be very useful to understand the complex heterogeneity of uh, sort of a cave cave structure. Yeah, the, the, particularly the small scale uh, interaction between the, the sedimentary structures, the joint patterns, uh, mm. and the bedding, and and the, and and then you know the the not 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 microcast as such, but just the small caverns and cavities that are that are connecting things together, um, and that that's coming out on the on the on the GPR, and they're they're able to map this out and you can you could sort of see the um the the joints and the bedding and the cross strat in from these uh, oolitics uh sandbars which are um then heavily castified excellent well uh it looks like our questions have petered out here um so what i'm gonna say is uh to thank you one more time charlie for this excellent presentation I think it was very instructive and, and a lot of the questions here um, you answered with a plum. So thank you very much. Thank I'll you. clap and uh, people around the world can clap wherever they are as well. Um, but in closing, I'd like to say, don't forget to join us next Wednesday when Marta Kozma is going to discuss the 3D architecture of a hypertidal point bar at Mont Saint-Michel Bay, France. Um, and so I guess I'll just say um, thank you, and we'll see you next week.